Okay, we're starting uh, the more on extraneous variables and confound slideshow. And uh, I'm doing a, something a little different. I'm using the microphone uh, on my webcam so I don't have to wear the headphones. And it's a little different. So uh, hopefully you have uh, watched the uh, advanced methods uh, slideshows, number one and two. That's the prerequisite for this slideshow. And uh, we'll begin uh, with uh, confounds. And uh, here we have a, a subway scene with two uh, Monty Python knights who say ni, which may confound many of the riders. The normal use of the term confound means to confuse. So let's talk about terminology. Uh, we have constants in an experiment. Constants such as the time of day, that is, we always run the experiment in the morning. Constants such as the researcher, we use the same researcher uh, for the entire experiment. Or the laboratory, we always run the experiment in the same laboratory. Now we have some variables in our experiments, uh, independent and dependent variables, which we've talked about, and extraneous variables. Uh, what makes a variable variable is it's not constant. So for example, uh, if we are doing an experiment on the time of day on study skill usage, time of day would be a variable because we change or vary the time of day. If we have uh, different researchers, researchers would not be a constant but a variable because we vary the researchers from uh, Cherry to Liz, for example. Extraneous variables are nuisance factors uh, which are uncontrolled. They are variables that are not our IV or DV. That's what we mean by a nuisance factor. A confound is an extraneous variable which co-varies with the levels of the independent variable, and we'll be describing that in great detail soon. Extraneous variables. Extraneous means outside. Uh, so we can talk about the extraneous weather, the outside weather. Uh, we want only the IV and the DV to vary. That is, the only variables we want in an experiment are IVs and DVs. All other variables must be held constant, or we want them to be constant. If not constant, they're a variable, and they're extraneous variables. Anything that varies in an experiment which is not the IV or the DV is by definition an extraneous variable. Finally, if the levels of the extraneous variable co-vary with the levels of the IV, that's a confound. And as you can tell by the font that I've used, it's probably not a good thing. So let's first look at an example, example number one. In an experiment, researchers are interested in a light level on productivity. So we have three separate work areas, low, medium, and highlight. And we measure the uh, output of, you know, uh, you know, over eight hours. And that will be uh, the productivity. So uh, take a second, stop the slideshow, and read through the uh, example again. And uh, answer those two questions. What was the IV and what was the DV? So uh, hopefully you're able to identify light level as the independent variable and productivity as the dependent variable. And I've indicated the levels of the independent variable, bright, moderate, and low. I've also indicated the operational definition of the dependent variable. So now to continue example number one, what would happen if over the course of the experiment the temperature in the factory increased from 72 to 80 degrees. Uh, here's an example of what I'm talking about. So at 8 o'clock in the morning, the factory is at 72. At noon, it goes up to 78. And by 4 o'clock at the end of the shift, it's at 80 degrees. And uh, the temperature is increasing in the entire factory. So that influences the temperature in the low light condition, the moderate light condition, and the high light condition. Also, I've indicated on there the uh, you know, dependent variable measure. Uh, the low light uh, condition, they produce 51 units. 
moderate 89 units and highlight 49 units. So first off, what varies? Uh, the light level varies. It goes from low to moderate to high. The temperature varies. It goes from 72 to 80. Productivity varies. It, go, uh, it goes from 49 units to 89 units. Uh, these are the three variables in our experiment. Uh, the IV is the light level, so light level varies, but that's our independent variable. Productivity varies, but that's our dependent variable. Temperature varies, it's neither our IV or DV, so therefore temperature is an extraneous variable. Now, an extraneous variable may or may not be a confound. For an extraneous variable to become, become a confound, the levels of the EV must co-vary with the levels of the IV. So uh, stop the uh, slideshow for a minute and again identify the levels of the extraneous variable. Uh, you may want to go back and take a look at the written example. And we've already identified the levels of the IV, so uh, go back and check uh, your notes for that also. So, Stop the slideshow, identify the levels of the EV and of the IV. And so uh, we've already identified the levels of the IV as low, moderate, and bright. And the levels of the EV, as I indicate on the uh, you know, chart, 72 degrees, 78 degrees, and 80 degrees. Now that we have identified the levels of the EV and the IV, we have to ask ourselves the question, do the subjects in the low light uh, level always and only get the same level of temperature? And that's the key question to allow us to identify if they co-vary. So in our example, uh, the EV 72, 78, and 80, uh, the levels of the uh, IV are low, moderate, and bright. Do they co-vary? Do subjects in the low light level always and only get the same temperature? No. Uh, so therefore there is no confounding in this example. Now let's take a look at another example, example number two. We're still in the factory, uh, but in this example what would happen if the temperature in the three separate work areas were different? Uh, 72 degrees in the low light area, 78 degrees in the media, medium light area, and 80 degrees in the high light area. And here's a chart to illustrate what I'm talking about. Low light area, the temperature is at 72 degrees. Moderate, 78 degrees. High light, 80 degrees. So again, I ask you what varies. Uh, light level, temperature, productivity. Light level is the independent variable. Productivity is the dependent variable. Temperature varies. It's neither the IV nor the DV, so therefore it's an extraneous variable. But now we need to uh, ask ourselves about confounding. So as I mentioned before, an EV may or may not be a confound. So we have the levels of the EV 72, 78, and 80. Now we ask ourselves the question, do subjects in the low light level always and only get the same level of temperature? And the answer is yes. That is, if you're in the low light condition, you always get the same temperature and only those in the low light condition get that level of temperature. So yes, they are confounded. We would say that temperature and light level are confounded. And here, going back to the chart, I've circled the levels of the IV, low, moderate, and high, and then I've shown you how they co-vary. Low light always gets 72 degrees, moderate light always gets 78 degrees, high light always gets 80 degrees. So the problem with a confound can be easily seen in this uh, chart. So we ask ourselves, what causes more productivity? Is it moderate light levels? Is it 78 degrees? The answer is we don't know. And this is where we go back to the idea that in the vernacular, a confound means uh, to confound, means to confuse. Basically, we have a confused experiment. 
we don't know if temperature or lighting is the cause of the increased productivity, we're confused. We don't do an experiment to become more confused. We do an experiment to resolve confusion. So that's why confounds are bad. And then let's move on to this third example from your textbook. Uh, the idea of masked versus distributed practice. That is, studying or practicing some skill either massed all at once or distributed over several settings or over several study sessions. So in this example, the independent variable is the level is the amount of distributed practice. Uh, you're studying for a psychology, psychology exam just one day, or you're studying for the exam across two days, or you're studying for the exam across three days and the dependent variable is exam score. So table 5.1 shows us uh, what's going on in the three groups uh, in this experiment. Uh, in group number one, they study for three hours on Monday. That is the masked one day study session. And then Friday they have the exam. Group number two, uh, they have two days of distributed studying. Monday and Tuesday, they study for three hours on Monday three hours on Tuesday. And then group number three, uh, they have three days of distributed practice. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, they stay for three hours each. And then they uh, take the exam on Friday. Why don't you stop the slideshow here and think about what the, con uh, the extraneous variables are and whether or not they're confounded. And I will give you a hint there are two confounded extraneous variables, two confounds. So stop the slideshow, and when you have identified them, continue on. And as we can see from this table here, uh, we have the independent variable, the distributed practice of one, two, or three days. The first extraneous variable is study hours. Uh, subjects in the one-day condition only get three study hours, uh, but subjects in the three-day condition get nine study hours. And the second extraneous variable is retention interval. Those in the one day of mass practice have to wait three days before they can take the test. And those in the three days of distributed practice condition only have to wait one day. And so what we find is that those in the one day uh, mass practice have the worst or the lousiest performance. Those in the uh, two day condition do average. And those in the three day condition uh, do the greatest. Uh, so the question is, again, these are confounded because I've drawn the circles around to indicate how uh, the uh, IV co-varies with EV1 and EV2. That is those in the three-day condition, they and only they get nine hours of practice and have a one-day retention interval. So what is causing really good performance for that three days of distributed practice group? Is it that they have distributed practice or is it they have the shortest uh, retention interval or is it that they have the most amount of study hours? We don't know. They're confounded. And as I just said, why did this happen? Is it the IV? Is it the number of study hours? Or is it the retention interval? We don't know. The answer, all three. Oftentimes we'll talk about confounds as alternative interpretations or alternative explanations of the results. I could say that distributed practice leads to the best, uh, uh, the best uh, test scores, but somebody could come along with an alternative interpretation of those results, saying it's not the distributed practice, but it's the number of hours that you're studying. We don't want to have these alternative explanations. We want only one, which is our favorite explanation. So when we have a situation like this where we have a confound, we have to control those confounds. So uh, as I, uh, you know, on top is the chart that we had before, and at the bottom is a chart of the days of the week. 
uh, why don't you stop the slideshow and try to figure out how to unconfound uh, the IV from the two extraneous variables. As you can see, what we can do to unconfound them is this. Uh, on Monday, uh, only group number three studies for 20 minutes. On Tuesday, group number uh, two studies for 30 minutes. And group number three studies for 20 minutes. And on Wednesday, group number one studies for 60 minutes. Group number two studies for 30 minutes. And group number three studies for 20 minutes. So when I fill out the top uh, table, we find out that all groups have the same number of study hours, one, and that all groups have the same retention interval that is the same length from the last time they studied to the exam. So in this situation, we've controlled for the extraneous variables, and now we have a nice non-confounded study. And finally, uh, an important topic when we're talking about extraneous variables and conf confounds, are extraneous variables good or bad? Uh, you might say that extraneous variables are bad because they could become conf confounded, and you're exactly right. Uh, extraneous variables are very dangerous and scary for an experimenter because they could easily become confounded without you knowing about it. That could ruin your experiment. So in that case, extraneous variables are bad. But also, extraneous variables are good. Uh, here's how. Uh, extra uh, external, extraneous, external, boy, tongue twister. External validity is how well the results of your experiment can be generalized to other people, other situations, other uh, locations. The best way to have good external validity is to include examples of all the people, all the situations you want to generalize to in your experiment. So let's say I have an experiment with just men in it. Uh, I cannot generalize the results of this experiment to women because there were no women in the experiment. So this would mean my experiment lacked external validity. So in order to have better external validity, I'd have to have both men and women in my experiment. That would make uh, gender an extraneous variable. So in this case, and that means that it has better external validity. So in this case, uh, you know, extraneous variables are good because they lead to better external validity, which is a good thing. However, extraneous variables can be bad in that uh, extraneous variables will usually increase your error variance. Error variance is the variance within each one of your groups. And error variance is inversely related to statistical power. For example, if we look at that simple T formula at the bottom, your T statistic, uh, the larger that is, the more likely you'll find significance. So therefore, that T is related to power. The larger T is, the more power you have. Uh, in the numerator is the difference between the means of the two groups. That's the effect size, more or less. In the denominator is your error variance. As you increase your error variance in the denominator, t will get smaller. So t, which is more or less power, will get smaller. So when you increase your error variance, uh, you are less likely to have uh, st you know, statistically significant findings. What increases error variance? extraneous variables. Anything that makes uh, anything different within the groups of your experiment that are unrelated to your independent variable, that is error variance. So uh, going back to men and women in your experiment, in some cases I've had experiments with low statistical power and in trying to increase the power what I've done is I've gone after error variance. And one way I've gone off to, after error variance is to actually remove one gender from the experiment. And that works in some cases. That is, I would have men and women in the, in the experiment, and I would not have you know, high statistical power. So I'd get rid of one gender uh, and only have men or only have women. And that would, by reducing or removing that extraneous variable, 
I would reduce my error variance and increase my statistical power. And so that would make it more likely that I'd find something statistically significant. So in that case, extraneous variables, because they're related to error variance, are bad. My final point is that because extraneous variables are sometimes good, sometimes bad, it's impossible to design the perfect experiment. Uh, if you have extraneous variables in it, uh, then you're going to have good external validity, but you're going to have low statistical power. And also, those EVs could become confounded. But then again, if you have no extraneous variables in it, uh, then uh, you're going to have a very artificial, fakey uh, experiment which lacks external validity. So uh, the point is, you cannot design the perfect experiment ever. That's it for today. Bye-bye.